Hello, my name is Aaron Todd, and I was a research engineering intern at Mozilla this summer. I'm going to be talking about my work on the Rust language's new runtime system, and in particular, the schedule, scheduler for lightweight tasks, which uses a work stealing strategy now. So there are a lot of questions you might have about runtimes or Rust. I'm going to try and answer some of them. What I really want to get covered in this 10 or 15 minutes is the basics of what a work stealing scheduler is and what it does and what part of the runtime it is. And then there are a little bit of details about the data structure used to make this as efficient as possible. So first, a little bit about Rust. Many of you are already pretty familiar with Rust, um, having seen other talks on the subject. But the core concept we need from Rust is that it's just a good language for systems programming. It tries to be both type safe through a pretty conventional static type system and also memory safe through Rust's pretty novel region system for giving you static guarantees on your memory usage. And then while giving you all this safety and also some helpful abstractions like traits and general good features from a modern language, it tries to do this with zero cost. So you can write code that's just as efficient as any old C++ you would write if you were a competent C++ programmer. Um, one example application is browser engine, um, like Servo, which Tim talked about recently. So the runtime is just a bunch of stuff that goes on to help your program run. Um, sort of nebulously defined, and what it actually does can vary depending on the language. Um, the JVM is an example runtime. Pretty much every language but C or C++ has a runtime of some sort. And even C and C++ applications frequently have some sort of runtime written in C or C++. Um, in Rust, we rely on the runtime to schedule the lightweight Rust tasks. And it also is responsible for IO management and garbage collection. Um, Rust doesn't have JIT yet. Maybe it will someday. But it's a pretty common thing for runtimes like the JVM to do. So task scheduling is going to be the focus. Now, the Rust runtime in its current or now old state, it was written in C++. It had a very simple task scheduler. It didn't really do much for IO management. It was just not a great runtime. It was a great first attempt to get the language going, and it was great to build off of. But there's a lot we can do differently to make it better. So the goal was to change almost everything about the runtime. And given that we were changing so much, it makes sense to just rewrite it from scratch, get the benefits of clean code. But rewriting from scratch, we've got this language Rust. It's good for low-level systems programming, like writing a runtime. So Rust is now one of the very few languages out there with a self-hosting runtime. Runtime is written almost entirely in Rust now. So another important definition, what is a task? In Rust, a task is just a lightweight thread. And the most important thing about these lightweight threads, other than that they're lightweight, is they don't actually share memory with other threads. So you can't get any concurrent memory access issues. Um, it's one of the things Rust enforces through its memory safety. But what you do is you communicate information between these tasks by passing messages over channels. And while this can sound kind of inefficient, Rust's region systems allows you to just pass an owned pointer to a thing to another task. So if you have a giant data structure in the global heap, you can just send a pointer to it over a channel, and the region system will statically guarantee that the other task takes full ownership of it and remove your access to it, and that you get great high-performance memory-safe message sending. Um, one drawback of tasks, though, is that they're cooperatively scheduled. Since you don't have magical kernel powers, you can't just preempt a for loop while it's executing. So these tasks, you have to not screw up in that sense. No infinite for loops. We can't save you from that. Some runtimes do do some preemption, um, because any time you pass into the runtime from a task, like when you allocate or do garbage collection or increase the size of your stack, the runtime is free to preempt at that point. But you can write a program that does none of those things in Rust. So the most basic type of scheduling that you could do is you take a giant global queue of tasks to work on, and you make a bunch of workers, probably one for each CPU thread that you have. And then you just have those workers take tasks off the queue, run the tasks, put the tasks back in the queue. Very straightforward. Problem is contention. This doesn't usually work out very well. You have a lot of threads that are trying to use this queue. And they're trying to use both ends of the queue all the time. So they spend lots of time fighting with each other. And you get very bad performance. And the queue frequently just fills up with stuff and doesn't drain very fast. And it's just not a good solution. 
So one place to go from there is to have separate work queues for each worker thread. And this is what the old Rust runtime in C is doing. And the idea here is when you spawn a task, you put it into the thread local queue. Well, the old runtime does a little bit more than this. When you spawn a task, you just put it in your local queue. And when you dequeue a task, you grab it out of your local queue. And this is great and all because there's no contention. As long as all your workers have stuff to do, everything is great. The problem is you frequently end up with a case where your workers don't all have stuff to do. One task ends up doing a bunch of work, spawning a bunch of new tasks locally, and the other threads all finish and go to sleep. And this is kind of bad. You don't want this. So what we need to do is move the work between the worker threads such that all the worker threads are doing stuff. And there are a couple approaches to this. So at the very broad sense, you can do something like static scheduling, where you know exactly what you're doing, you know details about the workload, and you can think hard. You also know details about your hardware. And you can just figure out what the optimal schedule is ahead of time to allocate the work. And the problem with this is you don't actually have all this detail, and you don't have time to think about it in the general case, which is why we can't do any static scheduling like this. So for the general case, you need some sort of dynamic scheduling, where you just do something. It has to be really easy to do, and you just hope it works well enough most of the time. But it's going to be suboptimal to static scheduling when you can pull that off. And the particular type of dynamic scheduling we do in Rust is called work stealing. This is a very standard approach used all the time because it's so effective. And the basic idea is when your local work queue doesn't have any work to do and you want to do work, you just steal some work from another worker thread's queue. And this gives you the benefit of using your local queue as much as you can, but you still have the option of getting work someplace else. And the amount of effort it takes to get work from someplace else is very low um, because you're just stealing it only when you need it. Uh, the problem with a strategy where you fan out work across worker threads is it's just much higher overhead than this. Now, back to contention, which is a big deal again because now we're sharing queues between tasks. And one thing we can do to make things a little more efficient is we let the worker only push and pop on its local queue. So it only uses the left end. And then we can make threads that steal only use the right end, separate the responsibilities a bit. So owner pushes and pops from the left, other threads steal from the right. And there's actually a very, very optimized data structure for exactly this use case used in almost every work stealing runtime there is called the chase left deck. And it's backed by an array, so it's pretty fast and easy to manipulate. And the other notable feature is that it's lock-free. And you'll hear lots of people talking about lock-free code, like it's this fancy new thing. <laughs> and it is pretty great. It's not a magic bullet, but it is pretty great in a lot of situations like this one. And the basic idea behind it is that instead of using locks to manage your concurrent memory access, you use atomic memory operations, which are a little bit quicker. Um, the basic idea for many data structures like the chase left deck is to use a compare and swap operation. And what you do is you read a word. Say in this case, it would be the index of the top element in the deck because you're trying to steal something. And then you do some stuff say, take out the element at the top of the index and grab a pointer to it. And then you try and modify the original top index to decrement it because you removed an element from the deck. But if someone else is doing this at the same time, you can have multiple people dequeue the same element and decrement this index at the same time. Bad things happen. So what a compare and swap does is it says, only decrement that index if no one else has done it first. So by being the first person or worker to succeed at this, you guarantee that you are the only one who dequeues that task. And this sort of compare and swap style of coding makes many concurrent data structures very quick, um, a lot more complicated in the code, but very quick. And the most important part is there'll be a lot of hand waving about maybe lock free code isn't that great, you shouldn't worry about it that much. But for this use case, it's empirically way faster. So now we've got all the bits, I'll assemble them together. So we've got the n worker threads, one per CPU core, and then we have a chase lev deck for every single worker thread. And then whenever you make new work, you push it onto your local chase lev deck. Whenever you can and you need to do work, you dequeue it locally, 
there's no work to do locally, you steal from a random other scheduler's chase left deck on the other side. So results. That's pretty much all there is to work stealing. It's actually a very simple concept. Um, so the Rust implementation. And the first fact about it is it's not actually done yet. So the work stealing part of it is there, and the Rust scheduler is pretty much all working in Rust. We turned it on by default yesterday, which was pretty exciting. But the chase left deck is currently not in use, so we're missing that big part. It should be a big speed up when we implement it. And there are a lot of other really simple optimizations we can do to make this go a lot faster. But surprisingly, despite all these low-hanging optimizations, we are pretty quick. So here are some benchmark graphs comparing the old runtime, which was written in C++, and the new runtime, which is written in Rust and has the work stealing enabled. So on one side, we've got the message passing benchmark, which is pretty equivalent. Um, the new runtime is a little slower than the old runtime for many cases, just because we haven't optimized it that much. But where the new runtime does pretty well is in spawning new tasks. You can spawn, this benchmark spawns a million tasks in a single thread. It's sort of a worst case scenario for straining the spawn system. And the new runtime handles it pretty well. The old runtime handles it very poorly. Sometimes it can't even complete the benchmark. Um, Parfib is a very naive parallel Fibonacci, and it strains spawning tasks in sort of a fork join style and having the task spawn spread out over all of the worker threads. And there we also saw a really, really impressive speed up. Um, <laughs> task spawn performance or something was just not going well for the old runtime. So that's about all I have. Um, in conclusion, Rust was actually a really nice language to use for this. Um, normally we'd use something like C or C++ for writing this level of a code. But Rust is great. It does pretty well. The memory safety that Rust gives you is actually really useful, even though you do need shared mutable state um, in an implementation of a runtime, because it forces you to really think about when you do it and make it very explicit what you're doing. And we're hoping the new runtime will catch up on message passing pretty soon and be pretty fast. And of course, I'll thank my mentor, Brian Anderson, and the rest of the runtime interns and the Rust and Servo teams in Mozilla. And Etc. Any questions? Ben? Yes. It would throw an error about running out of memory, something about malloc, and then it would crash. Oh. Um, spawning, I guess, just isn't very efficient in the old runtime. Like, it's not terrible. As you can see, it wins in message passing performance, but it had its false flaws. Any other questions or things I should clarify? I think I went through that pretty quickly. Yeah, um, I have a question. Okay. Um, lower is better in all these steps, right? Yes, lower is better. Um, so it looks like the runtime is basically outperforming. Oh, no. Yeah. Message passing is the opposite. Um, higher is better in this. Oh, okay. So this is well, messages per second per core. And you can see the old runtime gets between 500,000 and a million, and the new runtime is more like 300,000 to 600,000. Okay. Um, I have two questions with my same question. Okay. Um, one, uh, why are we bad at this happening? Um, and number two, uh, considering that we still have a global work group with all CPUs So the new runtime doesn't have a global work queue anymore. Oh, it doesn't? Yes, the work stealing part is all finished in the new runtime. We just don't have the fancy queue implementation. Oh, fine. OK. Then question one. OK. So there are a lot of internal details to the scheduler that I didn't touch on. It's actually really complicated inside. And it's very tightly integrated with an event loop for doing IO management. You don't need to that. OK. <laughs> but for everyone else. Yeah. And one of the things we do is every pass through the scheduler and every iteration is actually a run processing an event in this event loop. And right now, we just need to make sure that the scheduler processes an event when there's a work to do. So we just send it events all the time saying, go do this work, go do this work. And every time we ping it with a new event, we're creating a new callback object, um, which is another allocation and a bunch of work to make sure it does that event. 
They're doing this a few times per message pass, when in reality we should be doing it only one allocation and then sending many fewer of these callbacks. So that'll be a big speed difference. Ben, you got a question? Yeah, seems the Ben's had the same question. Eric? Probably pretty easy. It's hard to judge. Like some things are really easy to do when they sound easy, and some things are not easy to do when they sound easy. Yeah, I've got two more weeks, and I should be able to finish this pretty easily. So an example of easy optimization is we fixed the debugging print macro to not format the strings when it wasn't printing them, and we saw a 50% performance increase on the benchmarks for the new runtime. Um, that was a one-line pull request. So there's, we're, we're serious about the low-hanging optimizations here. Okay, I guess I'll wrap up, unless people have more questions. Patrick? Yeah, so an example of how hard it is to introduce these races, when I was preparing this presentation, um, dealing with races isn't actually something I thought of because I didn't do it very often. Um, there were just that few of them. Um, there are other segments of the runtime that do have races, but the scheduling stuff had very, very, very few, if any. And it's all thanks to Rust. <laughs> <laughs>